the Advanced Tech Podcast, providing a spotlight for innovators and disruptors. For links and show notes, and to find out how to sponsor the Advanced Tech Podcast, go to advancedtechmedia.org. You can also find and sponsor us on Patreon. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a rating. You can also sponsor us using Bitcoin at advancedtechmedia.org slash sponsor. Welcome to the Advanced Tech Podcast. Joining me today is John Carvalho, CEO of Synonym. Welcome, John. Thanks. Glad to be of here. Course. For the one or two listeners who may not know your background, could you tell them about it? I have been around a while, but it seems like you kind of have to reintroduce yourself every cycle because it's always new people. And, you know, there isn't a lot of people like looking at the history of everything. So, yeah, uh, my background is I've been in Bitcoin for about nine years. I have done a lot of different projects and different, you know, participated in Bitcoin in every way you could imagine. And in recent years, I've started more on the professional side where I used to work at BitRefill um, as their chief communications officer and also doing some business development work there. And then I left BitRefill amicably to start this new company called Synonym, which is a new sort of, uh, you know, an additional company in the family of companies of Tether and Bitfinex to basically stay focused on creating Bitcoin products and realizing sort of the, the Bitcoin idealistic vision through an ecosystem. So what is it that you're looking to achieve and accomplish with that with Synonym? We want to show with our, both our expertise and experience that, you know, how you can do these use cases without requiring extra blockchains or blockchains at all in many cases. And so, you know, we set out to model what a Bitcoin future might actually look like if it did actually win and start, you know, obsoleting certain aspects of the economy. What would those aspects be replaced with? And so we're trying to actually be mindful about like what the whole stack of products and technology uh, would have to be in place to actually facilitate a reality where this is true. And so we want to kind of combine delivering the kind of hyper Bitcoinization future vision for Bitcoin with demonstrating how that, you know, is possible and does actually obsolete the narratives of some of the alternatives. So given that you're not necessarily a, a Lightning Network company, in your opinion, what does the Lightning Network unlock? In, in the very like, you know, abstract or literal sense, it unlocks the kind of uh, medium of exchange aspect, the currency aspect of Bitcoin, because it is a way of doing high quantity, high frequency of transactions in an affordable way. And because it's instant in how it behaves and, you know, when, when you're completing a payment and because the invoicing is actually like strict, you know, you have to pay the exact amount, you, you know, you get some info about what you're paying. That makes it all much more user friendly and much more more appropriate for commercial situations. And so I, I think that's the biggest, you know, core thing that Lightning does is it makes Bitcoin much more friendly for the merchant and consumer environment. That's often been a, a criticism of Bitcoin is that the user friendliness isn't necessarily there. But I, I would argue in the last few years, we're starting to see some really compelling products that are intuitive. You know, it's sort of that iPhone intuitiveness that you see in other, other types of products. You know, I think there's a kind of community aspect of how we evolve and in, in understand how what, what works and what does not. And we are getting better at it over time. Like Bitcoin, it, it, there are certain challenges in place, you know, like having to be online, having to be connected, having to have enough Bitcoin in the direction that you're trying to move Bitcoin, um, routing. All, there's a lot of different challenges that you that we have to learn how to properly abstract from the user. To answer your question in maybe a little bit different way, you know, a lot of people think Lightning is a lot of other things as well. Um, you know, a lot of people think that maybe you can do other types of things like bring the web into the Lightning Network. This is something that we're kind of on the fence about or uh, not necessarily ab agreeing with, depending on the, the use case, because, you know, we have other technology we're using that shows how you don't have to like slave everything to, to the Bitcoin network to use, you know, cool self-sovereign web use cases. And so that would maybe be a, a difference with our company and how we see Lightning as well. Um, I'd like to dig into that a little bit more. So we first met in El Salvador on the uh, Design UX panel at Adopting Bitcoin. And one of the topics was, you know, designing sp specifically for the Lightning Network and for Bitcoin uh, with products in mind. Um, what were some of the highlights for people that may not have uh, watched or listened to that uh, or been able to attend? What would you like to sum up in terms of UX and design and where 
where, where we kind of need to go with that. You know, I think the name of it was something along the lines of if it looks better, it works better. Mm -hmm. um, and I would almost <laughs> say the opposite. Like if it works better, it looks better. You, you really want to make sure it's actually accomplishing what the user needs to accomplish with as little friction as possible. And that, that was part of the theme of what we discussed. Um, we also discussed masking this both in the user interface and in the terminology from the user without banging them on the head with like all the how the technology works, but still without also lying to them about the risks and trade-offs. The user experience and the UI and how we present this to people is, is definitely an evolving thing. You know, one of the things we're doing is um, we, have, we have Block Tank, which is our LSP server, which can be integrated with a wallet to, to create you know, better user experiences. And then in our wallet, we have like new user flows that we're going to try to introduce to show maybe better ways to onboard people to Lightning and better ways to be sensitive to what the Lightning user is trying to do and, and help them fulfill that goal. What are some of the ways that companies in this space can help strengthen the network? In my opinion, I think that companies should be trying to give users, you know, the whole self-custodial experience. Some companies are kind of opting for a very custodial or bank-like experience and then trying to either keep it that way or to kind of evolve over time to eventually give the user more control and more freedom and more privacy. The answer is probably somewhere in between a little bit, but in the end, I think that companies are the ones in the best position to kind of lay out this network and the culture now in the beginning and establish it for a long time. And I think that one thing the companies could do is definitely include things like, for example, if you're going to put Lightning, try to put a node inside. You know, Lightning Labs has Neutrino, which is a way to have a light mobile node so the user can hold their own keys. And some other Lightning implementations allow you to hold your own keys just as a default design. I think adopting Lightning at all is still a huge thing uh, companies can do. And on that level, I think custodial or payment processors are a little more appropriate because you know you, you can use them to like outsource your liquidity or problems or some of your node management problem. You end up strengthening the network in multiple ways more and more over time. It could just be the simple amount of just accepting Bitcoin as a payment method. That's like just a basic way of you're helping. But then you end up running a node because it's easier and safer to do so in order to do that. And then maybe you end up running a lightning node and end up, you know, you just get deeper and deeper into it and become more of the infrastructure. What are some of the products and innovations in the space that you find interesting? Um, and conversely, also, what's lacking? What, uh, what are people not building that uh, should be looked at? It's the things we're using in our stack, right? So like Lightning would be one. We're also using Omnibolt, which is a way of doing tokens on Lightning. And we're using our own protocol called Slash Tag. So I guess there's some bias there because I would say that's another important one. As far as things that we're not currently using in our stack that I'm interested about, I would say DLCs are pretty interesting. This is kind of a way to do smart contracts without having to put everything on chain. It introduces you know, new capabilities to introduce use oracles as a kind of trusted mechanism for outcomes. I think once that matures, you'll definitely see us try to leverage that in creative ways. I mean, there's always new things people are proposing, like for softworks for Bitcoin and for ways to improve the user experience on the technical level for Lightning. My philosophy on those is kind of like, I try to pretend they don't exist until they actually exist. Trying to rely on something and build on something or, you know, anticipate something I've learned, you know, from experience is something that, you know, it's not really the best way to manage a company. It's not the best way to plan your roadmap because you, you just don't know for sure when these things will be released or ready. What's lacking and what's not being developed? Like, what uh, are we yes. what are we missing? I would say everything is kind of in the right, going in the right direction. I, I don't want to be overly critical and say that things are severely lacking in any special way. It just takes a lot of time. There is a decent amount of funding that came towards the Lightning Network and Lightning Network projects recently. So that has improved. Now there's a lot of support. You might even say too much support for open source development and grants and things like this. Like there's an option. There's a lot of options for people now. So that that that's something that maybe we could say was lacking, but is definitely improving. I don't know if it's a lacking thing, but maybe a critical thing. I would say Bitcoiners that are envious of shitcoiner, you know, successes or or accomplishments. I, I'd like to see that die down a bit. The only way you can compete with scamming is to scam. And I don't really want to see us trying to figure out this like weird angle where we can scam without, but, but being able to claim that we're not scamming just so we can like, you know, entice 
developers to come over from Ethereum or entice, you know, gamblers coming over from the, the hottest, you know, smart chain, multi-chain Web3 coin. Like, I, I just don't think we should care about that. And I think not caring about that and focusing on what's important is going to pay off much better in the long run, even if it's not sexy in the moment. And so, yeah. There's a lot of incredibly talented people in Bitcoin, and I would argue more so in Bitcoin. In fact, I think any of the other protocols, the only strength they have is they're really strong in marketing. So is that maybe one of the shortfalls that perhaps we're missing, or is there something else that we're not seeing? I think that because Bitcoin, for most of its history, has been engineer-led and technology-led, it's been a healthy focus because we focus on efficiency and you know security and privacy and these are things that are obviously extremely important but these are not things that sell and these are not things that necessarily demonstrate use cases so i would say like the user experience level or the design level and the marketing level certainly ended up having less specialization you know, from our community. But again, like this is a, a weird line, a, a pretty gray area where you talk about the difference between being good at communicating the utility and being good at creating a narrative. At some point, the narrative becomes lies. And, in, and this is a line that most Bitcoiners don't really want to cross um, and they don't even want to approach. We haven't done a good job showing the people that are, you know, moved by the altcoin narratives how to do what they're trying to do using Bitcoin instead and demonstrating that, you know, um, because I think that if that were apparent and obvious, people would see the scammy parts for what they are. They'd say, okay, like this coin's telling me I, I need this coin to do X, Y, Z, but like there's already a full healthy community of X, Y, Z over on Bitcoin and they don't need any coin for it, you know, or this whole community exists and they don't even use Bitcoin at all to do it. Like, why do I have to pay for this? Why do I have to invest in this? Like, what's the point? We also don't do a great, that great of a job of being creative about how to apply Bitcoin and Lightning in ways that really show how this is actually better than what you had before. You know, like even as a PayPal user or as a Venmo user or Cash App user or any, any of these kind of like newer banking apps that are obviously much more interesting to people than their traditional banking apps, even with that, we're not competing that well. And so we really have to show people ways that like now that you have Bitcoin, this is possible and it wasn't possible before. And that is something that we have to have a lot more creativity and a lot more innovation, you know, at, at applying Lightning and Bitcoin and different technologies like that. So it's not easy. Um, we're doing our best to try to, you know, tackle those kinds of problems. But at the very least, what you can do is like make a mistake others haven't made before. And so just don't repeat what others have done. And eventually we, we will find new paths. I remember in the design panel, we talked about a lot of uh, good resources for uh, people looking at, uh, at UX and design for Bitcoin. So I'll link some of those, but are there others that you're aware of and other projects that are perhaps working on things that are doing a really good job of communicating and design and UX? I mean, obviously I took a look at your website, it's pretty cool. But what other products and, and projects uh, do you think are doing a good job and are a good standard? As you know, and as you'll probably, what you were already alluding to, the formerly known as Square Crypto and now the Spiral uh, Group out of Block, informally Square, um, they have been doing a pretty good job at creating an actual entity and funding, you know, open design and just miscellaneous projects related to user experience and design and aesthetic aspects of applications. And that's that's the premier one really to mention in this in this sense. I know that there are others kind of dabbling, but I don't think there's anything really significant as far as focused on, you know, open user experience, you know, advancement. You could probably start trying to isolate specific companies that do a better job at advancing this than others, but you know, that that's also subjective to a certain degree. So it, it's hard to say which wallet you think did a great job is definitely going to be different than which wallet somebody else thinks did a great job. And so it's good that we have competition. Eventually, the competition becomes you know great for the consumer. Um, but right now, I would say it's still very early for everything, and nobody has really like quote unquote won. You know, like any even the most successful Lightning app, you're talking about probably twenty thousand users at most, like active. Like it, it's still pretty small. I honestly can't think of any that would be remotely as significant as the the spiral effort. Yeah, that's that's all I got. 
That's cool. We'll make sure we link uh, Spiral in the show notes. So let's switch over to free and open source. So this show has always been big supporters of the free and open source software movement. What are some of the projects that are developing in that space that you find really interesting? I don't know what the threshold is between calling something a free open source project and an open source, you know, project from a company, because in the end, there's always a group of people that administer the repo and kind of there's, there's a governance aspect to every open source project. My my values and what I'm trying to accomplish, I guess I'll mention the one that I forgot to mention earlier, which is Hypercore. Um, and Hypercore is sort of like a newer, you know, cooler version of BitTorrent. Um, so it has nothing to do with blockchains per se, um, but it is a way of doing, you know, a sort of decentralized storage and swarming and networking aspects to accomplish some of the other goals we want to accomplish to have a self-sovereign web. And so this is a way that people can kind of start forming the storage layer and the kind of file sharing layer. And then now, you know, we can put on top of this monetization and other aspects to connect it to Bitcoin. Um, and, and so that's a project that we utilize in our stack and we're very interested in that I would like to see more people contribute to and be interested in. Um, and, and it's not owned by a company or anything like that. It's, it was community developed. So, and it, it is free and open source. Um, you know, obviously Lightning Network is another one. I don't know what I would call the DLC sort of thing. It's this sort of multiple parties working on it. And I don't know if there's a specific, you know, repo for everything. And this is how Lightning is as well. Each implementation is pretty much run by a company. So wh where do we draw the line on free open source software as a project? You know, it really just depends, I guess, on how many people are contributing to it. And if there's actually like a lot of interest for people to openly contribute to it. Those are a couple that I think are definitely worth mentioning. So in your opinion, what does the Lightning Network look like in 2030? I think that by then we'll definitely be in, this is going to be funny to watch this in eight years. Um, <laughs> by then, I, I like to think that we have Lightning as a popular payment option in retail. You know, where you go, if you go to the store, no matter where you go in the world, it's going to be, you know, a pretty good chance that they're going to accept Bitcoin, accept Lightning, and you'll have a pretty good chance that you'll you know be familiar with some some app that you would use to be able to pay using Lightning. As far as the like actual popularity and user base of Lightning, I still think it's going to take more time than people would like to have like popularity to to achieve that. But you never know. Like these things can happen really fast. And like for example, one of the things we're working on is bringing tokens to the Lightning Network technology. And so if we have like Tether, which is $80 billion right now of, of, of tokens issued, if we start moving any portion of that over to the Bitcoin Lightning Network, and that ends up being a, a reason why merchants now become more likely to add it to their point of sale systems and accept it as a form of payment. Well, now you're kind of backdooring Lightning into the system through dollars. And that could be at least an additional angle to make this more likely. And it could even be one that is even stronger. It could be that, you know, once we have, you know, tokens on Lightning, maybe it's so appropriate for the use case and so appropriate for the network that all of a sudden we have a million people in one year like it, it really could change things in 2030 i would at least like to to see that you know lightning is a popular commercial tech like like i'm trying to predict that it will be um and used by you know millions of people that would be a nice prediction and nice to see so this has been a fun experience my network's dropped out a couple of times so slightly different camera angle um to uh, just to respect John's time, we had a couple more. I had a couple more questions for him, but uh, what I'd like to do is ask uh, if you have any questions for our listeners. What we're trying to do is, is fairly ambitious, and it involves a lot of different dimensions of problems to solve for Bitcoin and for the web and for the economy and things like this. And we've done our best to make this like kind of a comprehensive, you know, vision and comprehensive ecosystem, and now a comprehensive narrative. But the the narrative is hard to communicate and takes some time to communicate. You know, I would ask your listeners to let me know which narratives that they've seen come from myself and from our materials that resonate with them, that make sense to them, that speak to them. Um, and also the opposite, you know, which things we say are just flying over their head. They don't see the point. They don't understand it. It's intimidating. They don't even know why we're bothering. You know, we, both, both sides of that, I think, are very useful for me to know because 
because I'm just over here, you know, trying to operate in the dark. And so if I can find where the edges are of this paradigm, then I can try to stay in the middle and try to keep people, you know, focused on what's important and what actually is like useful to them. What, what are the best channels to reach you and where can people find you on social? For the company, the website is synonym.to, synonym.2. We also are on Twitter as synonym underscore to. You can find us uh, in Telegram. Similarly, we have a specific chat room for slash tags. You can find t.me slash slash tags for people that want to play with our protocol that we're making for the web use cases, which is, you know, there's, there's some people in there now playing with it and trying to contribute and give feedback about it. And so if you're interested on that level, you can go there. And then for to find me and my my own feeds and things, you know, Bitcoin error log on all formats. So if you're looking for me on Telegram for chat or for um, Twitter for my shit posting and other criticisms, um, you know, Bitcoin error log is where, where you'll find me. Did you want to just take a moment to tell the audience about your podcast and uh, kind of what you feature on Sure. Um, so a while back, while we were still in stealth mode, you know, I went from a drastic change where at BitRefill, I was doing podcasts, you know, at least every month, if not more often, and I was going to conferences. But when you're in stealth mode, you know, in a new company, you can't really talk about everything. And so, and it's too early to even talk about it. And so I was trying to find an outlet or a way to kind of tease people a little bit of, you know, how we are as a company and the kind of thing, the way we would approach a problem, but also how have some sort of outlet, you know, both creatively and, you know, and also for a marketing sense to, to remind people that we still existed and we still, you know, what, what kind of world we were in. And so we have a podcast called The Biz, which is hosted by me. And every episode is crowdfunded through a concept called a crowd wall. And the crowd wall is basically this one goal of Bitcoin in SATs that anybody can contribute towards and is proportionally unlocked. And so if the goal is a million sats and you donate 1% of the goal, 1% of the audio becomes unlocked and free for everyone. And so once 100% of the goal is hit, the podcast becomes totally free, the episode, and is distributed by Bitcoin Magazine through their uh, channels, you know, their various podcast channels. And we also give 50% of the income from each podcast to a pre-designated, you know, uh, open source project or, or a charity of sorts, you know, related to the Bitcoin world. And so we've done that five times already. The sixth episode is up now. It's, you know, roughly 50, 60% unlocked at the moment. And people can go and, and try all of this and try try the tech um, and help unlock it at thebiz.pro. Um, and then, you know, as you might have guessed, the name being the biz, the theme of the guests is all professional. And so I'm trying to, you know, isolate people that I, I are part of my business world and have conversations and topics that are more related to running a Bitcoin business, working within a Bitcoin business, you know, and keeping a Bitcoin business alive and successful. So we cover things from, you know, fundraising to business development to growth and advertising, you know, a lot of the stuff that non-professional Bitcoiners might find a little boring, but I, I didn't, you know, we have enough content of people talking about how great Bitcoin is. I wanted to try to help people that actually want to build with Bitcoin. And that's the whole idea. Yeah, it's really important to talk about these things because if you're working on an amazing product, but no one knows about it, um, I mean, it kind of dies a slow death, unfortunately. And there are, yeah. some, there are some great solutions out there, but they're just not getting airplay. So that's awesome that you're doing that. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, this show has a community page, so I'd be happy to link the biz. I mean, of course, we'll include it in the show notes, but be happy to link the biz there. Uh, some, some sure, questions. that would be awesome. Cool. I appreciate it. You bet. All right, John, thanks so much for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you out there in the Bitcoin world. Thanks for having me. See you soon.